Good afternoon. Sorry for the delay, but uh, at least that's what she told me. Samantha was finishing. What were you finishing? An op-ed for the New York Times tomorrow? Okay. <laughs> well, I'm Ernesto Cedillo, uh, director of the Yale Center for the Study of Globalization. I thank you for being here this afternoon. It is uh, my pleasure to welcome Samantha Power back uh, to her university. Samantha is a graduate of Yale College and of the Harvard Law School. And she's also the founding executive director of the Carr Center for Human Rights uh, at the Kennedy School of Harvard University, where she's also a lecturer. Despite uh, her youth, Samantha is already recognized both as a leading expert on human rights and US uh, foreign policy, and as an accomplished journalist. In fact, uh, her impressive, uh, dramatic, uh, and very professional account of uh, US uh, foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis some terrible episodes of genocide earned her the Pulitzer Prize last year with this uh, book, A Problem from Hell, America and the Age of Genocide. Samantha has kindly accepted to speak this afternoon about American foreign policy in an age of terror, and afterwards to engage uh, in a dialogue with uh, those of you who may want to pursue farther the topic uh, of this uh, afternoon's uh, conversation. Dear friends, let's welcome Samantha Power. I lend you my watch, but you have to oh, give it back to me. <laughs> <laughs> I could walk away with the watch of a president. <laughs> Um, it's great to be here. Um, thank you all of you for coming out. I'm sorry we scheduled this um, on Passover, um, but uh, at least we were able to get some of you um, in attendance. It's a great thrill uh, to come back to uh, Yale. Uh, I do teach at Harvard now, but there just is no comparison. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, when I, when I last uh, returned, I had the, the singular uh, terrifying experience of my uh, professional and academic and personal life, which was that my senior essay advisor, Gaddis Smith, uh, was the respondent on my book uh, about a week into the book's life. And um, I believe, um, not only did I surprise it, but, or did I survive the, the ordeal, um, but Gaddis, the teacher and the grader that he is, was the first to say to me, this book is going to win the Pulitzer Prize. I tell you, there's awards. This book is destined for awards. <laughs> and I said, you're crazy. This book is barely destined for publication, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, it's both, uh, as always, intimidating to be here in front of my former teachers. Uh, Fred Strebe is here as well, I see. And, uh, and, but it's also uh, a great thrill. Um, what I'm going to do is not talk about genocide. My, my piece for tomorrow's paper is actually on um, something bordering on genocide anyway that's occurring in western Sudan in Darfur. And uh, as many of you know, this is the 10-year anniversary this week of the Rwandan genocide. So there's an awful lot of yammering again about never again. And um, it doesn't seem as if our mechanisms are any better uh, oiled or readied uh, to respond to cases of uh, ethnically uh, derived slaughter and, and deportation. So we can talk about that in the question period if, if you'd like. But what I thought I would do is talk about um, terrorism, U.S. foreign policy, and human rights, and basically ask uh, what can the relationship between human rights and national security be, uh, and what should it be in an age of terror? Um, something pretty dramatic happened um, going on now six months ago uh, in Washington, um, which is that George Bush uh, stood up at the American Enterprise Institute, and he delivered what has now become known as the Age of Liberty speech. Now, Bush, as you know, probably in his national security strategy document, um, uh, 
stressed uh, human rights and, and liberty and dignity and freedom more than any president uh, actually in American history. Um, he used the term, the phrase in this National Security Strategy Doctrine, uh, human rights, he used that phrase five times, human dignity nine times, liberty 11 times, democracy 13 times, and freedom, which is of course the favorite formulation, 46 times. Um, this Age of Liberty speech, which would come a couple years after the, the uh, National Security Strategy uh, document was uh, uh, unveiled, um, used the phrase or the term freedom 40 times and liberty 18 times. But much more interesting uh, than the kind of nod to freedom and, and to liberty that, that has been a kind of steady nod actually now for the last couple of years since 9-11, um, and a little bit before, but, but really a, a, a ramping up, um, was the content of the speech. And I'm just going to read you a, a short portion of the speech. Again, many of you have probably already seen it. Um, but what Bush said uh, in front of the American Enterprise Institute is he said, some skeptics of democracy assert that the traditions of Islam are inhospitable to representative government. This cultural condescension, as Ronald Reagan termed it, has a long history. After the Japanese surrender in 1945, a so-called Japan expert asserted that democracy in that former empire would, quote, never work. Another observer declared that the prospects for democracy in post-Hitler Germany are, and I quote, or he quotes, most uncertain at best. He made that claim in 1957. Time after time, observers have questioned whether this country or that people or this group are ready for democracy as if freedom were a prize you win for meeting our own Western standards of progress. This is George Bush speaking. Uh, it should be clear to all that Islam, the faith of one-fifth of humanity, is consistent with democratic rule. Turkey, Indonesia, Senegal, Albania, Niger, Sierra Leone, more than half of all Muslims in the world live in freedom under democratically constituted governments. They succeed in democratic societies, not in spite of their faith, but because of it. Now here's where he says something really interesting and radical. He says, 60 years of Western nations excusing and accommodating the lack of freedom in the Middle East did nothing to make us safe. Because in the long run, stability cannot be purchased at the expense of liberty. Now this is a kind of radical idea. One, because it, it is a, an acknowledgment of past bad policies, mistaken policies, backing of repressive regimes, and that actually coming back to haunt us. Now, it's a diffusion of responsibility. It's not 60 years of America backing. It's Western nations, so it's us as part of something larger, but accommodating lack of freedom, uh, appeasing, effectively, uh, he's saying is at odds with our the, the enshrinement of our long-term liberty. As long as the Middle East remains a place where freedom does not flourish, it will remain a place of stagnation, resentment, and violence ready for export. And with the spread of weapons, of course, that can bring catastrophic harm to our country and to our friends, it would be reckless to accept the status quo. Okay, there are two ways that one can interpret this. And what I'm going to do today is um, talk about why even if we, you know, I'll tell you about the two ways in a second, but even if we give it the charitable interpretation and take at its face uh, this kind of murmuring in Washington now about democratization and the, at, at a minimum, even if we're not seeing policy outcomes yet, a recognition somewhere in the kind of bowels of, of a variety of institutions, including even the Pentagon, but a recognition that uh, interests and values can't actually be compartmentalized in the way that they have been for basically the entire existence of this country and certainly in the last 50 years, uh, that they can't be compartmentalized, that in fact, uh, you know, perceiving national interest as being narrowly defined in terms of security and economic interests, if you don't actually incorporate concern for human rights and liberalization of these societies, then you will privilege your short-term security actually often at the expense of your long-term security. Um, so even if this, if we take take this at its face, and there are two ways we can do it. We can we can cynically say, um, you know, this is all just rhetoric, just like the war in Iraq was about other things. You know, uh, you know, sort of grounded in in the language of, of freedom and genocide suppression or preemptive prevention or retrospective punishment or something. But it was really all about oil, or it was all about daddy, or it was all about weapons that weren't there, but that they thought were there, or they didn't think was there, but thought might be useful to say were there, or it was about the terrorism link, or was it just about beating somebody up in the Middle East once in a while so as to show the rest of the region that you mean business? Whatever you think the realpolitik motive was, you could hear this speech and say, ah, it's the same old, same old. You know, you rhetoric, yammer, 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 but in fact, 
uh, foreign policy will be made, uh, you know, in the way that it's always been made uh, on behalf of these security and economic interests. And Iraq is, is uh, witness or testament to that. Th this interpretation, um, I think, brings to mind um, Gandhi's remark uh, when he was asked about what he thought about Christianity. Um, this Bush's sort of language, talk about freedom. Uh, what Gandhi said when he was asked about what he thought about Christi Christianity, he said, it's a marvelous idea. Someone should try it sometime. And I think th that is the reaction that many have to, to Bush's uh, language, which is freedom. Yeah, 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 it's a good thing. Uh, we'd like to see um, some evidence of some policy changes in the face of this so-called recognition. But there's another interpretation, which I'm going to take, um, uh, at least as, uh, as mine, for, for t today's purposes which is that there is this recognition that I mentioned in Washington uh, that values and interests uh, actually belong together, that they have to be intertwined. There, is, there are people looking around and seeing a correlative connection between nuclear proliferation and arms shipments uh, to other countries, um, and a correlative con connection between that and human rights records, North Korea, Iraq, Pakistan, Iran, arguably. Um, also, of course, one just looks at the 9-11 hijackers and takes note for all the talk of the axis of evil um, that the hijackers themselves, of course, came not from uh, uh, axis of evil countries, but from Saudi Arabia and Egypt, U.S. allies. Um, there is something going on somewhere in which the short-sightedness taught by Gaddis Smith, of course, forever here at Yale, of the idea of the enemy of my enemy is my friend, or he may be a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. The short-sightedness short of that, I think, is, has become apparent to some people. Now, we can talk about who. And, and what good it does in a minute. But there is, even having said that, I do want to issue this caveat, that even with those people, there is something very instrumental now about what freedom is. That is, it's still about us. It's still about advancing, promoting democracy, because we don't want those societies to become threats to us. So the, the end, even at, again at its best, where you actually have this, this recognition, um, they only matter insofar as they become a threat to us. And of course, that has great bearing in societies like Zimbabwe or Sierra Leone or, or Sudan, where, where interest is either seen to cut in favor still of uh, uh, security interests or seen to cut in favor of backing uh, repressive regimes or at least turning a blind eye to atrocities, or again, in Zimbabwe and Sierra Leone, countries that have no bearing whatsoever um, on, uh, on terrorism, at least, again, in the short term. Um, so you will see in this framework, even if, again, we take it at its, at its face, that certain countries who can't offer an al-Qaeda connection um, might well be excluded or simply forgotten in this new, you know, uh, alleged commitment to an age of liberty. But let's just take, um, again, this idea that something's going on and people are debating and they're trying to think about how to roll up their sleeves and what liberalization means. And let me talk, if I could, uh, first about some structural challenges to integrating human rights into US foreign policy that actually have very little to do with George Bush, but have to do with the nature of how foreign policy is carried out. And then the second part of the, the talk, um, to talk specifically about what uh, Bush has done and could do um, to make this a more viable project if, in fact, uh, a critical mass ever comes together to make it a, a sincere project. First, um, structurally, and some of this will sound very obvious uh, to you, but I think it's worth saying because um, there is, we do bring a certain incredulity uh, uh, until we get jaded, of course, um, to um, some of the ways in which human rights uh, is not factored into foreign policy, or at least I do. Um, but one point, of course, structurally, that is uh, at great disadvantage for potential victims uh, of atrocity and, and of human rights abuse is that victims don't vote. Um, human rights. Uh, abuses carried out overseas um, uh, penalize uh, people who are not relevant political actors in this society. But more fundamental than that, um, human rights issues, even for those of us who care about human rights uh, or think we care, um, are not for us voting issues. So let me give um, the best example that I can give, which is uh, one that involves myself. I spent um, almost a decade unearthing U.S. responses to genocide and getting these government documents declassified and just looking at the kind of banality of bystanderhood and the bureaucratics of allowing genocide, I mean, this monstrous crime, and got more familiar than I ever wanted to be with the Clinton administration and its high and low-level officials who were involved in shaping or not shaping these policies. 
And when it came time for me to vote, the two, I have to say, the two most recent genocides, of course, would have been that in Bosnia and Srebrenica and that in Rwanda uh, in 1994. Um, these two genocides just happened. I'm living in the thick of trying to understand who did what, when, where, and why, and who didn't do what. And when it came time for me to vote in 1996, did, did Bill Clinton's response to Rwanda or Srebrenica have any bearing on how I voted in that election? Well, if it had, I, I would have voted for Bob Dole because Bob Dole was uh, not on Rwanda exactly, but, but on Bosnia was uh, you know, a, a major uh, energizer actually of a US response. Um, but w without saying who I did vote for, let me just say I didn't vote for Bob Dole. Uh, and, uh, and I don't think I'm unusual. And, and I don't mean this even that, that I'm partisan or that I come in with some, uh, that the, the fix is necessarily in every time I go to the voting booth. But, but when you, when you uh, are living in a society, it is uh, the issues that confront you, that surround you, that tend to be what you define your relationship to your leader uh, on the basis of. And, uh, and you know, many of us, I suppose, would have to ask ourselves, you know, if George Bush did the right thing, let's say, on Sudan, or suddenly decided to spearhead um, a peacekeeping effort outside of Ituri in Congo, or, or if he had moved US soldiers off that ship off the coast of Liberia and actually um, you know, put troops in harmed way. We can talk, we're going to talk in a second about whether US military intervention can be appropriate in light of the lack of legitimacy uh, associated with US power. But if he did all those things, would that change your uh, opinion of him? Would it change your vote? Would it, you know, what would it do? Well, for most people, it, it, it may change your opinion at the margins, but it probably won't change your vote. Second point about foreign policy is, um, again, quite obvious, but is that what the framers um, brought to this country was uh, a spectacular pessimism about human nature and a spectacular prophecy. Uh, and they built in to our system checks and balances born of the recognition that we are selfish and that we actually can't trust ourselves. So not only do we have checks and balances in local, state, and federal government, not only do we have three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial, and not only does the judiciary have control technically over the tyranny of the majority with, in applying the Bill of Rights against legislation. I mean, all of this is, is there, but we also have, of course, civil society groups and voters and other forms of checks and, and the press and so on uh, domestically. But all of this is, is predicated on the idea that we can't actually trust people in power to look out for minority rights, to look out for the important as well as the urgent. Um, and we need these structures. We, we, it's a whole system predicated on our fallibility and our selfishness. There's nothing like this uh, in place, of course, for foreign policy. So the same kind of short-termism and desire to privilege us, let's say, at the expense of them, whoever them are, is of course going to be with us uh, in the context of foreign policy. Third um, structural problem is has to do with, I think, the moral imagination. Um, even in uh, instances where the subject of distant suffering comes up in government, and keep in mind that one of the things you hear if you interview US officials, especially those uh, during the Clinton years, this is actually less true today, but it's what people will tell you is if you make a moral argument in government, you're not going to get invited to the next meeting. Um, again, that's less true in the Bush administration. Uh, you can make a moral argument. Whatever happens with it, I, I don't know, or whether it's you know, corrupted in a variety of ways. We'll leave that aside for a second. But, but um, even when you can make a moral argument and you can actually bring up the fate of the Rwandans, or in the case of, let's say, Uzbekistan today, where people apparently were boiled to death um, last month in, in Uzbekistan by the government that we remain aligned with um, in the interest of being able to use um, their bases uh, for entry into Afghanistan and elsewhere in, in uh, Central Asia. Um, but even if that comes up in a meeting, the ability to kind of go there and actually put yourself there and to, and to acquire uh, the kind of knowledge that isn't just abstract knowledge of human suffering, but that is knee buckling, you know, gut wrenching, you know, like literally like a punch in the tummy or the kind of knowledge that makes you cry as if it were somebody you knew. That kind of knowledge is very hard to acquire. So in the case of, let's say, some of the genocides I looked at, of course, um, you know, in Rwanda, we knew 100,000 and we knew 300,000. We even knew bodies bobbing down the river and we even had footage of people 
killing other people, but to stop and actually imagine, you know, your little boy being reduced to pleading, you know, to a machete-wielding Rwandan extremist, please don't kill me, I'll never be Tutsi again, which is what happened, and, and then being a mother and watching that young boy be struck down, that's a very different kind of knowledge. That's the, the knowledge that freezes a number um, or a, a, an abstract sort of set of sufferings um, and, 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 and sort of disaggregates it into its constituent individual parts. And not many of us bring that kind of imagination to the office every morning. So what you get are manifest risks to American interests, again, either security or economic or you know, just in terms of um, the financial cost of getting involved or you giving up bases or something very, very tangible on the one hand and something quite remote and abstract and often in places where very few of us and very few uh, officials have ever actually uh, visited or uh, acquainted themselves with in any kind of deep way. So when it comes to human rights and U.S. foreign policy, we tend to inhabit a kind of twilight between knowing and not knowing, even if the facts are available to us. Um, Fourth point um, is that uh, in order to override the longstanding default proposition, which is that American foreign policy is about economic and security interests, um, domestic political pressure is necessary. And I alluded to this in the, in the voting context. But when it comes to human rights, there's a major mobilization gap uh, in this country, in, in, in most uh, states, um, in the sense that we may all, in fact, there may be a majority of us out there who are ripe to be led on human rights related issues, actually even ripe to give something up, um, uh, whether money or uh, even to risk, um, you know, uh, American technology or, or even or American soldiers in the, in the case of genocide or something like it. That, that ripeness, that constituency might be out there. But the very universalism of human rights, uh, the thing that might make us all kind of nod when somebody makes a good argument on behalf of a Chinese dissident or an Uzbek, you know, uh, more recently, um, that universalism doesn't create the particular connection that gets us out of our chairs. And so what you see, I think, is a, a mobilization gap um, between a kind of passive constituency that we hope exists, that might exist, and the folks who actually, you know, who get out and, and, and move and make noise and change policy, or at least influence policy. And either in creating a constraint on policy, the perception that something is undoable, you know, that there will be a price to be paid if you do do something, or an enabling constituency. And you see this uh, recently, actually, in the context of Sudan, um, the tremendous effect, actually, that the religious right has had in this country in getting the Bush administration to take seriously the atrocities carried out by Khartoum against uh, rebels in the south, but also Christian civilians in the south of Sudan, and, and very, very high-level leadership that is about, uh, was about to culminate um, in a peace accord that would end you know, more than 20-year civil war. And that's about a particular connection. That's about saying, OK, they're like us. Sudan as a whole didn't get anybody. And we're, we're the big test for uh, the expansiveness of human connections is, can this particular connection now be harnessed and turned to focus on horrors uh, carried out against African Muslims? It's a big question. So far, the, the peace process has not turned. But that is the peril of particularism. Same is true with religious freedom uh, legislation and so on. It's very, very sensitive to um, crackdowns on Christians, um, but far less so against other uh, abuses, against the nature of the lobbies that are making, that are putting these laws in place, that are creating noise. Um, ethnic lobbies, of course, tend to get created, in the ethnic lobbies that turn up in this country tend to get created by atrocities or by genocide. Uh, look at the Armenian lobby here, even the Jewish community. Um, certainly, uh, the uh, Albanians played a, a really, really important role uh, in actually helping generate intervention in Kosovo. Um, but these lobbies tend to come about, you know, on the far side of, of uh, great suffering. Um, you see this point about politics and human rights, I think, also very notably in the Guantanamo context, where um, you know, it became very clear who the privileged uh, detainees actually were. They weren't privileged on the basis of where they'd been picked up or what they had done or been alleged to have done, or in the case of Guantanamo, thought, because many people are detained just on the basis of, of intent rather than action or alleged intent. Um, but it was actually on the basis of citizenship. It was whose government 
spoke the loudest and had the most clout. So it wasn't a coincidence at all that the British and the Australian suspects were told um, that there would be no death penalty uh, for them. Then they were the first to get counsel, and then they were the first to get to go home. Um, so I think that's, again, more analogous than directly on point to domestic constituencies. But mobilization is such a huge part of what will actually put human rights uh, center stage in, uh, or on the stage in, in Washington. Um, fifth point uh, is that international institutions that one might turn to um, for aid uh, in this domain um, are notoriously uh, defective. Uh, the Security Council, of course, has its problems. Its membership is anachronistic uh, and unrepresentative of power, of population, and of culture. Um, it has on it, of course, Russia, which is committing, has been committing crimes against humanity uh, in Chechnya, China, which, of course, has uh, a dreadful human rights record. Um, and, and these are structures, of course, not just at the Security Council, but elsewhere within the UN system that were put in place a long time ago to deal with very, very different threats um, and contingencies. Um, so, but as a matter of domestic politics, um, I just want to stress, because I'm going to come back to this, the UN um, is many things, um, and the Security Council, of course, is the most visible to Americans who confuse all the time, many of us do, in fact, um, wh when the UN is actually serving as a stage and when it is an actor in and of itself in a variety of ways, which again I'll come to. Um, but when we see the Security Council, it, it is experienced by Americans simply in terms of the constraint that it, that it places on American power. Um, we, we aren't relying on the UN as an actor to supply humanitarian aid. We're not relying uh, for the rule of law on uh, UN courts for the Rwanda or, or uh, for former Yugoslavia. Um, we, all we see of the UN is, is it's that body that couldn't endorse intervention in Kosovo or Iraq that got in our way twice. Um, and I think sort of fleshing out the complexity of that structure um, is very, very important. We see its cumbersome bureaucratic tendencies and its angry um, General Assembly. And we note, of course, that the General Assembly uh, four-month session is actually still scheduled uh, on the steamship schedules uh, from, 19, from the 1940s. That's why we have the four-month session that we do. It's still correlated to the steamship. You know, that's what people see of the UN. That's what they associate with the UN. Um, but one of the other reasons, and this will bring me to the second uh, part of the talk, which I'll go through quickly, um, one of the other reasons that it's really difficult now to inject human rights into foreign policy, apart from all these structural impediments, is that we aren't terribly welcome. Um, when, in fact, we put our minds to something like humanitarian intervention, uh, and I should say this was true even before uh, George Bush uh, took office, um, there is very little trust out there in the world about American motives, and, and certainly in the context of uh, nation-building exercises, there's zero trust in America's staying power, um, and they're related. I mean, the feeling is um, that we get in, get what we want, uh, and, you know, in the case of Bosnia or Kosovo, where, where we got in for mainly humanitarian reasons, um, it was also clear to people in the, in, on the ground and in the world that even though those were the reasons, the cause uh, was that it had become politically costly to do nothing. And so, of course, then you get involved quickly. You do away with the cost because you're seen to be acting. But then you get out before you've actually had time to do justice to the, to the people in whose name you've actually intervened, which, to, which isn't to say that non-intervention would have been preferable. But it is to say that there's a great discrepancy between the amount that is spent and the resources committed uh, to kind of military suppression and then the kind of uh, the, the, the wandering eye or the, the lack of attention span when it comes to the follow through, which is where, of course, societies are built and, and rule of law is created so that, that, that people will be able to control their own destinies. So we're in a kind of peculiar place when it comes to this you know, misnomer of humanitarian intervention in that the only people in the world who think that the East Timorese, the Kosovars, and the Afghans are any better off after the wars uh, that America was a part of carrying out in those countries um, the only people who think that they were better off are the East Timorese, the Kosovars, and the Afghans. Um, so we've, we've lost legitimacy, and that much is clear. And, and let me now turn to um, why we've lost legitimacy and, and how actually, despite all of these structural defects, with top-down leadership um, of the kind that could actually be conceivably mustered 
in the face of a perception of a threat, which is what we have now, is the, this feeling that all bets are off, that all systems have to be rethought, um, that we get to start anew. But a variety of things would really have to change in order for the U.S. to have the legitimacy, I think, and to be effective in the realm of human rights promotion and to have any part of uh, an age of liberty. So let me just sketch a few of the things that I think absolutely would have to be done, even, again, just assuming that we had the kind of top-down leadership that might overcome some of the, the premises in, in the last section of the talk, which, which were about domestic political pressures and constituencies and institutions and how difficult it is to find them and to service them uh, you know, on the human rights front. So here are some of the things that I think George Bush has to t tackle if he's going to go forward in, in, rhetor in, in practice in the way that he has been uh, of late uh, rhetorically. Um, first of all, again, this is all about legitimacy. Um, the United States uh, is more unilateralist now than it ever has been in its history. Um, American exceptionalism is not at all new. The presumption of American purity, um, the disproportionate power even, it's not, I mean, it's greater disproportion perhaps now, but Europe is more of a rival, so arguably it's, you know, but this is not, we've been more powerful than everyone else for quite a long time. Um, we have exempted ourselves from international treaties and from international institutions and from judgments that don't suit us. Um, and. I think all of this actually, frankly, should be re rethought, that the tradition of exceptionalism is very short-sighted. Um, but George Bush is taking the unilateralism um, to a new place. Um, and let me just give you a couple examples of things you've probably heard of um, where there is a feeling that it's actually an ideology of unilateralism or gratuitous unilateralism, actually, that it's not even tactically in our interest to be as hostile as we are being to uh, international institutions. And a couple of these things might, might actually surprise you. Um, you know, of course, that the, that the Bush administration is, has set out to kill the International Criminal Court, which is, of course, brand new and hasn't had any time even to engender the wrath in terms of its actual policies or, or uh, investigations uh, of this administration. But this is, again, an ideological belief shared by the Clinton administration that this court will not serve U.S. interests, that it will only be hostile to the United States. Um, now, what you may not know, though, is in addition to wanting to kill the court, in addition to unsigning the Rome Treaty, which is what John Bolton did, um, uh, you know, soon after George Bush took, took office, he called it the, the, the greatest moment of his life, was taking White out to the uh, U.S. signature on the, on the Rome Treaty. Um, but in addition to that, we actually have a piece of legislation that passed in 2002 uh, as part of something called the American Service Members Protection Act that has within it something called the Hague Invasion Clause. Now, what the Hague Invasion Clause authorizes U.S. forces to do is to invade Holland, in fact, <laughs> to liberate uh, U.S. soldiers or U.S. citizens who are unjustly detained uh, in, again, the Netherlands. Um, <laughs> If you're thinking about building alliances, um, and and if you're certainly if you're thinking about fighting a war on terrorism and generating kind of systemic cooperation across borders and and dealing with transnational threats uh, of the kind that obviously are facing this country and others, um, having sort of pieces of legislation and the Congress, of course, is implicated in in this uh, fully. Um, that that authorize the invasion of an ally that actually was supportive of the war in Iraq. Um, is not probably a, a good practice. Um, the second example in the context of the International Criminal Court is um, these bilateral treaties that we've been negotiating with uh, a variety of countries um, to try to get them to promise if U.S. I mean, it's such a long stretch kind of hypothetical that would have to happen in order for any of this stuff to come into play. Um, but if uh, an, uh, the ICC were to investigate or were to announce that it wanted to investigate it, a crime committed that rivaled genocide, systematic crimes against humanity, uh, or systematic war crimes, if it, the ICC announced this and the United States chose not to investigate it itself, which would, of course, if it did investigate, it would preempt the ICC's jurisdiction. So it would be a good thing to do. You can get in. You don't have to invade Holland. Um, but if you, if the U.S. chose not to investigate on the grounds that it was a trumped-up charge and the ICC went forward with its investigation and somehow the U.S. soldier or citizen in question ended up in a particular country such that that country that was a signatory to the Rome Treaty to the ICC would have to turn that person over to the court, 
In that event, the United States has negotiated these uh, bilateral treaties with these countries, getting them, the signatories, to promise not to turn over such a U.S. citizen who would have been involved in committing genocide. Okay, so that's, that's the spirit behind the bilateral treaties. We've got a lot of them. I think we've now got I, I, maybe two-thirds of the signatories have signed on and agreed not to turn over U.S. personnel. And many of these countries are new democracies who are just um, you know, embedding themselves within international institutions and international law. So getting them immediately to violate international law with bilateral treaties is not a good thing. But moreover, some countries have stood up and said, no, we're actually not going to sign away our right to comply with the treaty that we've already signed. Um, we will take the punishment. And believe it or not, what the United States has done is it's actually cut off military aid to two countries who've contributed troops to Iraq. So you actually have countries in Iraq that are serving alongside the United States in that um, escapade and who are getting less military assistance because they have, again, uh, insisted on complying with the international law that they've already signed. We also have uh, two countries that are partners in our drug interdiction efforts that we have cut off, again, military insist assistance to, and three kind of nascent democracies like Croatia and other countries that are kind of trying to stem nationalist tides, but again, who have been greeted um, you know, with uh, an aid cutoff. Now again, it's military aid, and whatever one thinks about military aid, but certainly from the Bush administration standpoint, many of these cases, this does seem to be an instance of kind of cutting off our noses um, to spite our faces. Um, second uh, example uh, I want to give briefly is um, is the Global Health Fund for HIV, uh, TB, and malaria. Um, the Bush administration, of course, made a much vaunted announcement of allocating 15 billion over five years. Not all, not even most of that money, of course, in year one has turned up yet. But notably, the Bush administration went to the mat to bypass again one of the few international institutions that hasn't yet had time to screw up which is the Global Health Fund, which is actually bringing to it uh, the very metrics um, and the kind of McKinsey approach of accountability and follow through on uh, you know, investment, as it were, in prevention, treatment, and care initiatives. Um, but, the, but the Bush administration, again, here's, a, here's an opportunity, to, we, and, and the, the announcement was made, not at all coincidentally, while Bush was making the case to go to war in Iraq. So this was meant to offset some of the hostility toward the United States engendered by the war, and yet the way we do it, the way we carry it out, almost on, you know, just as a matter of ideology, is to bypass an institution that already exists that is assembling a pretty good track record. Again, it hasn't been in place long enough for it to be an extensive track record. But what do we have to do then in terms of USAID and bilateral funding? We have to make it all up. We have to do exactly what they're doing and just replicate it internally. So again, uh, I think an example uh, of gratuitous unilateralism. Um, I think it's important to stress that the UN, uh, which is where unilateralism most often t takes form, is many, many things, and it, and it is very difficult, I think, to speak clearly about the institution in a way that all pe people can understand at once. It is a stage for big power exchanges, and it is, of course, as I said, an actor in its own right. Um, it is the UN Secretariat, after the NATO bomb Kosovo, that came in and ran the virtual protectorate there. Um, it is the World Food Program, part of the UN, uh, that averted famine in Afghanistan after the Taliban were dislodged, and which, and this again might surprise you, in the Iraqi war, it was the UN that kept Iraqis fed. Um, by June of last year, uh, the UN was delivering 1,000 tons of food an hour around the clock, and by the end of October, it had delivered 2.2 million tons of food worth uh, $1.5 billion. Now, this was food funded by the US and the UK, but it couldn't have been delivered by the soldiers. And what none of us knew while all this you know, uh, skirmishing was going on in New York was that covert negotiations were going on by which the World Food Program was going to team up uh, with US forces in order to make sure that Iraqis didn't die. And imagine, as bad as the bedlam was, given the lack or, or the insufficient pre-war planning, imagine how much worse it would have been if, those, if that 1.5 billion hadn't been dispersed. Um, and let's continue with what the UN did in Iraq. The UN again did in Iraq, where it was supposedly discredited. It was UN uh, Special Representative Sergio Verdamello who convinced Paul Bremer uh, to change his scheme for advisors. He was going to just come in, actually on the model of what Sergio had done in East Timor, as a kind of raj and have a team of advisors. But it was Sergio who had had the experience in East Timor and in Kosovo, came and said, no, you can't do advisors to you. 
You have to have a governing council, call it something else, and make it something else. It was the UN who persuaded uh, Bremer uh, to create uh, that institution. Turns out it was UN inspectors who convinced uh, Saddam Hussein to destroy his weapons of mass destruction. Who knew? <laughs> Um, and I think the important thing really to, uh, to point out when it comes to the UN is, is, is was never said better than by Dag Hammarskjöld, the second Secretary General. By the way, Kofi Annan says SG, Secretary General, stands not for Secretary General but for SG, scapegoat. Uh, <laughs> but but Hammarskjöld um, said uh, the UN was not created to take humanity to heaven but to save it from hell. And I think that, at least in the humanitarian function, the agency, the actor function of the UN is what it can do at its best. And I can say many negative things about the UN too, but I'll save that for the discussion. Um, second uh, point, and I'm running a little bit out of time now, but um, is um, after unilateralism, ahistoricism is, I think, fatal to American legitimacy. Um, Ernesto and I were speaking about it a little bit in the, in the car, but uh, I think America has to recognize, all states should recognize, but America, because of its disproportionate power and the way that it is watched and the way that even its mere words, like we sort of sneeze and there's a tidal wave, the way it can unleash a tidal wave in other countries, um, but, but that history matters. We, we have to recognize that and that people are keeping score uh, across a much broader stretch of time uh, and, and much broader scope. There's something quite admirable about America's forward-looking spirit uh, there's a kind of optimism where every leader comes into power and says the clock starts anew today with me. Um, but in fact, we inherit in the eyes of those affected by past policies, uh, the policies um, and effects of, uh, of those policies of our predecessors. Um, I think just to give an example, um, when Colin Powell went, for instance, to Halabja, uh, the scene of one of the more gruesome uh, attacks by Saddam Hussein carried out against the Kurds in 1988, 5,000 people murdered with chemical weapons, um, Colin Powell was, of course, uh, National Security Advisor during uh, the period where the, the chemical attacks took place. And of course, the US response at the time was to double aid to Saddam's regime while he was carrying out those attacks. Now, it wasn't, we didn't double our aid, of course, because of those attacks, um, but genocide was not, as I've shown, at all in and of itself something that would cause policy to turn. It was, it was sort of an incidental factor to be taken into consideration, really only at the margins. So because we, were, we wanted to double our aid, the farm lobby wanted to give Saddam more money to buy American farm products, that happened. The genocide wasn't gonna uh, play a role, but when, Colin Powell goes to Halabja and pays a tribute to the victims and the lives that are lost there. For him to miss that opportunity to make mention of what the U.S.'s position had been uh, at the time of Halabja, it seems to me, again, is a wasted opportunity. It was one that was noted by everybody there. Contrast that with um, Colin Powell's uh, response to a question on the eve of the war in Iraq, where a young woman said, what do you, Secretary Powell, how can you, the United States, go to war in Iraq in the name of human rights after everything you've done around the world? I mean, look at what you did to, in Chile with Allende. And, and Powell said, off the cuff, clearly without clearance, that is an event of which we are not proud, but our tactics have changed, and here are all the good reasons we, should, we have to go to war in Iraq. Well, here's an instance. I read about this on A27 in the New York Times and then went to the Chilean uh, the websites of Mercurio and Nacion, the two major papers, thinking, oh, there's probably some op-ed coverage here. This will probably surprise people that we actually just said we're not proud of having been involved in assassinating a foreign leader. And op-ed covered, I go to the op-ed page, eh, there's a few things. I go to the front page, there's no text on the front page of, of, of the major papers. It's just a single photo of the palace on fire uh, with Allende uh, in it, and it just says, mea culpa at last, Powell says, US not proud. So the extent to which even the scraps are taken. Third point, and I'll wrap with this, um, is unilateralism, ahistoricism, a la cartism. This is, this is, I think, really where the rubber meets the road. This is where, if we're serious about giving speeches, about backing repressive regimes, and, and, and if we could actually unpack that and even get into a little more detail to make people feel recognized in what they've gone through in their societies, even if we can get the history right, there is a way in which, and this is true of human nature as well as state policies generally, but where we, we look at issues within the four corners of the issue itself without seeing the ways in which the decisions we make in other areas utterly infect uh, 
our ability to get what we want or to make arguments that are heard on their face in a particular context. So take the argument for war in Iraq. When the Bush administration went to the Security Council, it really thought that it was losing the debate over the war in Iraq, either out of kind of European cravenness or because somehow it wasn't succeeding in persuading people about the merits of these arguments. Well, it turned out that the, most of the arguments that were made were, would prove um, uh, not to be terribly meritorious. Um, but at the time, I actually think, um, and I may be wrong again, the lack of proof on so many fronts um, may disable this particular argument in this context, but um, I actually think that our failure to win consensus in the Security Council had as much to do with our decision on Kyoto, our gratuitous unilateralism on the International Criminal Court, our bypassing the Global Health Fund, our backing other repressive regimes in the Middle East and not clarifying why this one was somehow different but pretending that the others kind of didn't exist. That this idea that we can just go and make what sound to us like good arguments in the moment without seeing the ways in which, again, other decisions, Guantanamo, um, you know, they all infect uh, you know, what it is that we're, we're trying to argue for uh, in the moment. So when we think, you know, farm subsidies just a domestic issue, well, no, actually, to the rest of the world, it's the issue that's helping contribute um, to the loss of lives and certainly the loss of livelihoods all throughout Africa, that they don't have a chance, that there's a, a fundamental hypocrisy to talk about free trade and, and, and um, when we talk about liberalization in the, in, in the Middle East, the speech I read you a portion of, um, and we don't really make mention, we don't, not even really, but we don't make mention of atrocities mm -hmm. in Chechnya or these boiling killings in Uzbekistan, countries that we need in the moment for the war And when we continue these policies of expedience, um, there's just no way that our words are, are going to be heard uh, on their face. Um, and of course, there is a contagion effect of the decisions that we make and the expediency that we use. Just to read you a quick line here from um, Hosni Mubarak um, just after uh, some of the new U.S. policies were announced after 9-11, including Guantanamo. Mubarak said that the new U.S. policies proved, quote, that we were right from the beginning in using all means, including military tribunals, to combat terrorism. There is no doubt that the events of September 11th created a new concept of democracy that differs from the concept that Western states defended before these events, especially in regard to freedom of the individual. Hi. Um, the Bush administration agrees uh, with Machiavelli that it is better to be feared than liked. But I think um, what all great American presidents and leaders have recognized, or at least the few that we will uh, have consensus on, um, but all leaders charged with maintaining this delicate balance between liberty and security, what they have recognized is that it is important actually to be feared, um, but it is far more important to be respected. And uh, what won the United States, the respect uh, of the world and the security that we now crave was not actually what we stood against, but what we stood for. Uh, it wasn't our hard power, but our soft power, our ability to make uh, others want what we want. Um, and right now, unfortunately, because of this loss of legitimacy, both for structural reasons and for the reasons that I've mentioned that are uh, new and remediable, um, others want to want what we don't want. Um, and I think the best guarantor of U.S. values and U.S. security, of principle and of interest, um, is a heightened commitment to principles like human rights, rule of law, civilian control of the military, and issues that we apply and, and principles we apply only in the breach and only when no other interests are seen to be at stake in opposition. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts and comments, questions. Thanks. Well, uh, we can see, Samantha, that uh, in spite of uh, so many years at Harvard, you haven't <laughs> lost the touch. Yet. <laughs> uh, Give me time. Who has a question? Yeah, yeah, a few. <laughs> um, it's really tricky. I mean, a lot of what I described, um, especially in the first part of the talk about the structural impediments to integrating human rights concerns into foreign policy, these are, these are, uh, would be true of just about any uh, state you look to. What I mentioned at the end in terms of ahistoricism, I mean, you really, 
I'm scratching my mind to think of a state um, that has actually chosen to remember harms that it has inflicted um, that wasn't under the barrel of the gun, like you know Germany or Japan, or that wasn't itself the product of regime change, like South Africa or something. I mean, now Germany apologized for atrocities carried out in, against the Herero, but that's what happens is even the cult of remembering or the or the culture of remembering gets gets integrated, and I think it, you can have some collateral effects having been under the barrel of the gun, and so on. So I take the question. I mean, it's it's really really challenging uh, to come up with models, but. Um, but there are some. I mean, you have, uh, for instance, um, in Sweden and in Canada, and these are the two off-sided models, um, uh, you know, much higher shares of, of GDP being pumped into foreign aid programs, much greater commitment for international institutions, which takes the edge off, um, you know, military deployments. Now, America is going to have great difficulty taking the edge off anything given the disproportionate power. Um, but I think part of what would have to uh, would have to change, I mean, it really is uh, cultural, in that you would start to, uh, one of the reasons Canada and Sweden can get away with, uh, Canada in particular can get away with peacekeeping and, and, and just forever, you know, deploying to Haiti now or, and uh, maybe to Congo, you know, in the next round of Congo deployments, and um, is that every Canadian boy grows up wanting to be a peacekeeper, apparently. It's like on your birth certificate. And um, although somebody said to me, um, uh, about Canadians is he cited to me the number of Canadians that lived uh, in New York City. I forget what it was, you know, some number of thousands of Canadians that lived in New York. And he said, you can tell them apart because they're the ones who say thank you when the money comes out of the ATM machine. <laughs> so it may actually be uh, more than a peacekeeping thing. There may be something else going on there that is in the water, perhaps. But uh, in Sweden, too, um, you know, just as their domestic uh, political structure is much errs much more on the side of social welfare. It just becomes part of what you know Sweden Swedishness looks like or what Swedishness is for. So a lot of the forces that I mentioned in terms of um, you know ripeness to be led in this country become actually just much more potent political variables in in, in countries like that. Um, in the sense that you know it's part of what it means to be a citizen, and so to deviate from that culturally. Actually, there can be a political cost, or at least there's a fear of that, such that people are moved by the prospect or the prospect of a of a cost. So there aren't um, really great models, um, except for you know kind of smaller powers. I mean, you know, most of the major powers are themselves, you know, much worse human rights abusers than than uh, than certainly the United States, even with its Guantanamo and its and its civil liberty infringements uh, after 9/11. Um, so no, it isn't it isn't pretty out there. But the United States has you know really unique uh, power uh, to use its leverage also on other on other entities. I mean, certainly other states are much more prone to contribute peacekeepers and to invest in international justice and international institutions that themselves then, at least in principle, develop kind of transcendental lives and bank accounts and, and minds of their own. And, and I, even as a first cut, to be much more supportive of those endeavors, which would sort of take it out of the nation state, which is structurally so disadvantaged when it comes to human rights, and move it to structures that are both accountable to states and to NGOs, um, but that actually stand for something else and aren't forever answering to constituencies and so on. But it's really hard because we talk about these transnational structures, but ultimately they, be, they remain so beholden to states that, to, that it, it kind of, you really have to get the domestic politics in these countries right or presidential leadership or executive leadership in order for there to be a filtering up effect to where these institutions actually become viable and effective. Yes, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, it's a great question, and when I mention the lack of trust, I mean obviously this is this is uh, there's a, a tremendous uh, skepticism. Um, as you may know, there's been this big uh, a kind of wave of debate about humanitarian intervention, where that phrase has been tossed in favor of this idea of the responsibility to protect. But from talking to African leaders and citizens, and that's would be the continent I would know best. I'm sure it's true, or I imagine it to be true also in East Asia and Central Asia. But 
they hear responsibility to protect, it's the same, they hear the same thing. I mean, they don't, it, it, it doesn't buy them anything, you know. It may work on, West, or it may, it's alleged to work on Western audiences so that it's, um, you know, they're not framing it in terms of a right of intervention, and, um, but it's somehow a duty, and they think there's going to be more resonance to that. But, I mean, again, you've got to come back to domestic politics and leadership and calculations of interest, and that's what's going to make people, you know, commit um, uh, to these kinds of uh, ventures. So calling it a responsibility to protect just sounds paternalistic, whereas a right of intervention, which is how it was framed in the 90s, sounded like, hey, we can go anywhere we want because we've got, it's our right, you know, because we're speaking in the name of universal principle. Um, so I would say that, um, that, the, that uh, as flawed as the UN Security Council uh, structure is, and again, there's not a person I don't think anymore, anywhere, except for maybe France, <laughs> uh, or the leaders of France, who would defend the Security Council composition. Uh, but um, <laughs> but I, think, um, I think as flawed as it is, because it's the only show in town, the you know, deference to the procedural check and to the UN Security Council should give way only in the face of massive, you know, a, th a threat of imminent, you know, massive loss of life, as in the case of uh, genocide, and in the case of Kosovo, uh, arguably anyway, a preventive uh, genocide. But what then has to happen is is not just the intervention and well, but it was righteous and therefore shouldn't it be apparent to everybody, but but much more, um, you know, kind of preventive, uh, not preventive, but much more public diplomacy on, you know, in engaging with Africa. I mean, this conversation has been basically white people getting together and telling, you know, uh, developing world countries, you know, what humanitarian intervention is, how it's necessary, this, that, the other. And the victims, like the Rwandans or the Liberians, are desperate for it. But all their neighbors, you know, see it as being, you know, necessarily about diamonds or about timber rights or about, you know, oil or, or Al-Qaeda. Um, so I think, to, to, to just even recognize what you're talking about, about this level of, of suspicion and, 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 and skepticism combined with, and it's very hard to do this a la carte, you know, making our policies more grounded in, in human rights across the board. So, the, I mean, that's what, that's the only thing eventually, you know, that, that will actually erode the suspicion and make, you know, uh, policies articulated on those grounds taken at their face is actually, you know, doing more of them for those reasons and not waiting until the Al-Qaeda cell turns up in order to, to rally troops from other countries. Th thirdly, final point on that, I would say um, the United States uh, really has to, we're in a very, very perilous place right now because the United States is, is despised and mistrusted, uh, despised by its foes and mistrusted by just about everybody else. Um, and yet there's no other leader <laughs> on the international stage who in the face of humanitarian catastrophe stands up and, and exerts any leadership. So what I would also say, uh, knowing that none of the reforms that I'm proposing or the changes in US culture are gonna happen uh, anytime soon, um, is that actually, as unpopular as we are, it is actually still incumbent on us to take a diplomatic leadership role even in, in countries that we've no intention of having any, and rightly so, because we're so discredited at present, but uh, military role in. So Sudan is a, a great example of that, where we, even as unpopular as we are, the United States still just has, uh, as it were, undue leverage over so many countries. So I think, you know, not taking an all or nothing approach um, and actually, you know, again, when you don't care as much about a problem, that's the ideal scenario by which you work through the United Nations. And take Sudan, <laughs> You could, this is a perfect moment for the Europeans to make the United States look really uh, silly or, or create a very interesting moment by bringing before the Security Council uh, uh, the possibility of an indictment uh, around the massacres in Western Sudan. So this is something that, that, okay, so the United States doesn't, of course, want to get involved militarily in Sudan. It's got this peace process. It's got working with Khartoum. It wants to, but here's a chance for France or Britain to come forward and say, we're going to refer something to the ICC. Are you really going to veto the investigation of the murder of people on the ground simply that, they're, that they have black skin? No, of course you, you know, can't do that. And of course, if John Bolton has his way, they will veto it. But that's a moment and that's an opportunity um, you know, for the United States to stand back in the interest of, of something larger than their own, again, short-term need. Yes, sir. Two things going on. There's the rhetoric, which is fabulous, which is saying universal dignity, 
non-negotiable principle of dignity, but then you have an increasingly militarized society, and you see the venom that poisons that moral imagination in the form of fear. So you end up mm. with people like people living in Israel where they're very afraid to go out on the streets, and they say, don't talk to me about some moral imagination globally. Tell me how I'm going to protect my children. So I see both happening in America mm. in the last few years, and I'm curious, is it all come out of wash? Or is, it, is the, the rhetoric a, a net benefit that's even better than the, the fear that's just because of the war? Or mm -hmm. are we good path, bad path? <laughs> Um, bad path, <laughs> uh, but uh, but interesting moment. Um, I mean, right now I think the fear is being appropriated and harnessed in a, in a very in a dangerous set of directions. I mean, in a, um, and it's being um, and just apart from that, and in the, in the context of the war on terrorism, there's an awful lot happening in the world that we're having nothing to do with because we're so focused on this. And so, I mean, just in every and, and non path, bad path and non path, um, but. You know, when you, I mean, I, I in, in um, traveling around and, and talking to people in, in America, um, one does sense, and I'm, I'm focusing on the part of your question that, that involved the moral imagination and, and the idea of politics kind of having a bearing on statecraft potentially, but, but one does sense, uh, I mean, a much more aggressive curiosity about the rest of the world. Um, one does sense... Uh, I mean, ironically, again, a, a resonance to Bush's, you know, moral appeals. I mean, which was all would have always been my argument in the context of genocide is actually that the policymakers were forever underestimating, and and then use, underestimating the American people, and then using, not coincidentally, using the American people as an alibi for their own unwillingness to take risks that, and 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 uh, and unwillingness to do anything that wasn't seen to be themselves, you know, in their own in the, in the short term national interest. Um, so there's something going on. Um, that actually, it's it's ripe to be channeled in in quite a different way. I mean, the temptation is always going to be there, especially after another attack, to kind of round. You know, I mean, it, it, that is. Um, I, I would hate. To, I, I mean, I suppose it's human nature, but but it's certainly proven in the number of the few security crises that America has had. It certainly proved to be American nature. Uh, I mean, in in that's in Guantanamo. Um, itself doesn't have a distinguished history if we think even about the, the detentions of Haitians, you know, with HIV who were sort of quarantined and, I mean, anything that is other, that is different, that is dangerous, put them in Guantanamo. Uh, somebody should write a book that's literally like the history of what happened in, you know, within those walls. Um, but I think where that can tip is when, and already you can feel it bubbling up, but when the, the awareness of the cost to the very things in whose name those lunges occur when the cost to security reveals itself. And it's a very difficult empirical case to make. I mean, it's all maybe for those of us here in kind of consensual New Haven. Um, it might be very obvious that, you know, anti-Americanism is bad for the war on terrorism. It's just harder to fight uh, threats when everyone hates you. That has to be true, right? <laughs> but that is actually very controversial and very hard to prove. Because the claim from, from um, some in Washington, um, many, I mean, the, the people making decisions in Washington is, well, you know, I mean, no one wants terrorist threats in their neighborhood. They're going to collaborate and cooperate regardless of whether we do Kyoto and, you know, go through multi-multi blah, blah. You know, th there is a sense that these are compartmentalizable. Uh, but I think, you know, if, if American, I hate to use the language of culture, but if for a long time we've gotten used to seeing ourselves as an exceptional nation, the, the gravity of the threat provides a moment for a leader to say, you know what, we have bypassed international institutions in the past, but we never had transnational threats quite like these. You know what, we haven't done international law, but you know, no one has more to gain from enforceable rules of the road than the most powerful superpower in the history of mankind. You know, the, the, there are ways to do it, but you know, I, I work for Wesley Clark in the campaign, so I'm, I'm you know, I, I, I've lost my guy, you know, who's, I, and I, I root for the Red Sox. I mean, I'm, I'm not the person to uh, look to for, for prophecy. Yeah. Monique. Yeah. 
But they don't each have names, do they? Do they? The, it's, it's Willie, right? Yeah. No, it's a. Has that been done, or do you think that that is a, in the future, obviously it didn't work in Rwanda, but in the future, do you think that that's something that can be successfully used to mobilize, say, in Rwanda? It's a very good question. I, as you know, but maybe people here um, don't know, it, Monique um, was this extraordinary human rights activist who Clinton coincidentally had met at a human rights ceremony. She'd gotten an award in December of 1993. So when the genocide started in April of 1994, he was obsessed with the fate of Monique. And, and in this instance, human rights groups used that personal connection in just the way you're suggesting with him as an individual. Um, and that was what they worked, and they worked it, and they worked it, and he, I mean, he went for it. It was, Monique, where's Monique? We gotta get Monique, I want every, I want no resource spare, we gotta get And no, 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 she wasn't like, it wasn't that, that kind of thing. <laughs> no, 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 Monica, Monique, uh, yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, not to my knowledge, anyway, but, um, but anyway, the government, uh, the, the people surrounded by him, his cat, everybody responded. They do. That's what it looks like. When, you know, we know also from George Bush. George Bush wanted Saddam Hussein and the Taliban gone. Guess what? George Bush and, uh, or we wish, uh, Saddam Hussein and the Taliban are now, are now gone. Uh, President Clinton wanted Monique saved. Guess what? Miraculously, somehow she was saved. I mean, it, it actually was a series of miracles, but also just everyone knew the price to be paid if, you know, Monique was actually harmed. But the effect of that, as you know uh, from your question, in the government was exactly the opposite from what we thought it would be. You know, you would think that the part would come to stand for the whole, and that thus, you know, once you've empathized with one person, that you can you can sort of you know map that you know in just the way you're 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 kind of suggesting you know across you know the faceless. But in fact, once Monique was rescued, Clinton lost interest in the Rwandan genocide. So actually, tending to the part became a substitute for tending to the whole. And I think that is the danger, actually. Um, but there are other ways to, but I, but I think it's better than, I mean, certainly speaking in terms of abstractions and speaking in terms of um, hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands, I mean, you know, you end up needing to get to such a high figure, especially in the wake of Rwanda now, when it comes to atrocity and genocide especially, uh, that just as the Holocaust provided too high or low a bar for Rwanda to measure up in real time, now Rwanda's in such a place that it's very hard to get for instance, people interested in Sudan, because it's only, you know, 50,000 or 30,000 or something who've been killed in the last few months. So numbers are not going to work on a lot of levels. People can, I, I think, single individuals, but not just profiling them and the kind of so-and-so, you know, has lost or this or that, but bringing them to Washington, you know, getting them to testify. There are very few members of Congress who can withstand actually those kinds of encounters and appeals. And mo as you know from the book, I mean, most of the upstanders, the people who flipped and turned and went from being bystanders to actually standing up in the system were people who'd had, were, it wasn't an abstraction and who had had those encounters. And then the other thing I would just say is, it's not just the, the victims and the survivors that can, that can provide the human drama that can mobilize people. I actually think also finding that individual, whether it's the Delaire or the, 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 the international person within the field who's, who is the voice for what should be done, who's very prescriptive, but who, who shows rather than tells, if you know what I mean, like somehow shows in his work or her work, um, or within the US government. I mean, to be able to expose policy clefts and divisions in real time is a really, really good way of then creating the sense of possibility among advocates. It kind of feeds on itself. Like in Rwanda, there was no dissent at all within the government. And so even the advocates were kind of like, they didn't even know what to root for. And the editorial boards were quiet. I mean, it, whereas in Bosnia, like everyone knew the State Department was just split. People were resigning. And that emboldened other people because they were sort of validated in believing that you should care and that things could be different. So I think as journalists or as human rights advocates or as citizens, you know, finding those people that are both your shepherds in terms of information and, as it were, your kind of, you know, mascots, uh, as, as you say, you know, for advocacy. It's really important. Yes, sir, in the back. Um, 
mentioned that you uh, you had some problems with the, the European ideas. You might mention, I was wondering uh, if you could speak about those and what you thought the United Nations could do to adjust to new challenges. Uh, do you think that, like, how can we facilitate such, like, reforms in the United Nations? And do you think that abandoning, uh, like, our gratuitous unilateralism that you spoke of will help facilitate such reforms? Or do you think that reform should be a prerequisite to abandoning our willingness to go it alone? I don't think it, I don't think the, the reforms can be a prerequisite because the United States is the, going to be the main engine for reforms and all, I mean and nothing for instance on the Security Council can happen um, you know without the United States as a, as a veto holder I mean we have a major clog in the Security Council because all reform is dependent and, and all power relinquishment is dependent on those entities that don't have to relinquish power by virtue of the Charter because they have the veto deciding to relinquish power. So we, we have human nature is being tested as, you know, in, a, in the form of states, I think, in a very interesting way. Do, do you give up power when you don't have to? <laughs> um, and um, I, so I, I, none, none of this UN, UN uh, reform uh, is going to take place without American uh, leadership and enthusiasm. But I don't think it can be, I mean, I think the, the tone of it uh, has to be like that, that I, I think Richard Holbrook managed um, in the tail end of the Clinton years. He managed to, you know, revamp um, the UN dues um, sort of structure. I mean, get the UN dues paid and revamp the billing and the and the sort of payments and lower UN U.S. Uh, contributions in certain areas. Um, but he did it by working with Congress and kind of demystifying the UN. I think in an important way. Um, and you know, it's a longer conversation probably, you know, to get into about what are the defects and so on. But basically, I think. Um, the UN is largely, the, the, the side of it that we know, as I suggested already, is a building. I mean, the UN is a building. And um, blaming the UN um, for things like Rwanda, and I have lots to say about Kofi Annan's specific responsibility, um, which maybe I'll say a word about, um, but blaming the UN for Rwanda or for Bosnia or for Iraq now, and it's literally, it's like blaming a building. It's like blaming Madison Square Garden when the Knicks don't play well. You know, you, you, when states come together and they operate on that stage and they can't forge consensus, it is the fault both of the, usually the issue and of the states and the inability to forge consensus. And it is a space for those disagreements to, to uh, uh, get played out. Now, you could say, well, but it shows that UN law or international law isn't binding on states. And yeah, that's true. Um, but again, that's less the product of the law, which Again, I'll say a word about needs needs uh, some some work, um, but it is the product of those who uh, won't adhere to it or, or interpret it differently and who can't force consensus on. So, in terms of, let me just give you an example of of where the UN has to behave differently in the context of Rwanda, which I mentioned, and Kofi Annan. Um, so, uh, UN peacekeepers were sent to Rwanda by the Security Council. The Security Council five uh, permanent members and 10 other states sent 2,500 troops into harm's way to patrol a peace. Um, three months in advance of the genocide, the commander on the ground got word that militias could exterminate at a rate of 1,000 every 20 minutes, sent a fax to Kofi Annan in New York, who was the head then of peacekeeping, not, not the Secretary General at the time. He got the fax and he said, oh shit, 1,000 <laughs> every 20 minutes, my god, wow. This is terrible. Uh, this peacekeeping mission, you know, can't persist in this in this context. This is, I mean, wow. And he said, but if I bring this to the Security Council, the states that sent these troops there, and we're very reluctant to send troops to begin with, they're going to say, "I'll oh, bring the troops home." And if I tell my commander, if I agree, if I allow my commander to confront these militias, then we're going to get mission creep, and it's going to be Somalia all over again. And then and then the member states are going to be unhappy again. So maybe I just won't show anybody the facts. Okay, that is a problem with the UN. I mean, that is, you know, that's not what you do. You, you cannot, and this is what, what UN officials have done all the time in their desire to stay relevant and, again, to occupy the land of the possible and to kind of, you know, keep things, I mean, knowing the member states' indifference or lack of interest in a lot of these places, and they try to will the problems away. No, the, what you need to do, I, I, I suppose, and I think, I think Anna may have learned this anyway, Brahimi uh, uh, issued this uh, report just articulating this very lesson. You don't internalize the constraints imposed by the member states. You externalize them. 
you force the spotlight back where it belongs, which is on the very states that sent those peacekeepers into harm's way. You leak the facts if, upon presenting it to the Security Council, you have failed to generate the support that you need to, to, to confront militias who can exterminate at a rate of 1,000 every 20 minutes. And if you do that, at least you can live with yourself three months later if, in fact, a genocide ensues. I mean, imagine being the person who buried the facts, um, thinking, well, the member states really wouldn't go along with anything more, but never actually testing the waters and, again, in testing them, perhaps even altering them. Um, and then just in terms of the UN Charter, I think um, it's, it's just essential to, uh, to recognize that, that um, in a nuclear age there are actually um, new threats. I mean, it, it, this is a charter written, it was written, I suppose, in a nuclear age, but, um, but that issues like proliferation um, uh, really do warrant some attention. I'm not making a case at all for preemption. Um, but generating a discussion that makes the United States feel uh, as if the charter has actually been uh, tailored toward these new threats and not merely to cross-border aggression, which is not, I mean, which is really what the whole UN, uh, you know, peace and security side of the UN is, is, is geared toward. Um, and the same would be true of internal uh, uh, threats like failed states. It's, there's just nothing in the UN apparatus as such um, that has, has kind of kept up with the with contemporary threats, uh, humanitarian and, and security. So all of that, I think, needs to be uh, reworked, but it'll require uh, U.S. Uh, participation and, and leadership. One last question. Okay, yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, Senator pointed to the responsibility of the international financial institutions in the, in the years previous to the, to the genocide in Rwanda and in the former Yugoslavia. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, I mean, I, the, um, the work, I think, of Peter Uven you're probably referring to, which is so, I think, important on what the international community, the way in which a state that was systematic, Rwanda, which was systematically uh, ethnically cleansing and occasionally murdering Tutsi, could be seen to be a good governor just by checking a number of IMF boxes, even though it was, you know, it just wasn't, you know, none of the international financial institutions incorporated the fact that you know half of its Tutsi minority was living outside the country, desperate to come home, but were uh, precluded. Obviously, the, the goal would be you know for that to change, and and um, the way again, just back to the discussion about the UN, the way institutions tend to change is when the states who shape them change. And the United States, I mean, Ernesto probably has many more thoughts on on the ifies than than I do, but um, you know if the United States itself hasn't chosen to prioritize atrocity prevention, you know, it's going to be the rare international institution that on its own decides to go against the most powerful state's wishes or even not go against it, because the United States might just assume that, you know, massacres be taken into account in certain cases. Um, but, but without leadership or without some kind of engine coming from somewhere, and again, ideally someone else would step forward into this vacuum where the United States doesn't seem to take leadership of these issues, where there is a problem in terms of, a major problem in terms of U.S. legitimacy to speak on these issues right now, um, that you would see some kind of leadership coming from someplace. But, um, you know, I do think it will be, again, that the, the more powerful states within the, the financial institutions that build in these kinds of criteria, but of course would be for it. Well, uh, before we finish, <laughs> Uh, oh my God. Games that come back uh, to the alma mater, we like to give uh, Thank one you. present, but you have to open it. Here. I do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very bad. Look, look out. And you, you, you wrap this yourself. Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you can be more wired. Yeah, but it's such lovely paper. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh. My God. <laughs> oh, you are. This is, you will not believe this. Okay. <laughs> this man is something else. He's not merely the president of Mexico, he's. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>